Hey, old man over there, leave your beautiful wife behind and go. Out of the blue, it happened. Four hefty thugs were lecherously looking down at my wife, almost salivating at her. In stark contrast, my youthful looking and petite wife, who you wouldn't believe is over 40, was clearly attracting the attention of these young men. On the other hand, I, approaching my late 50s, have a look that's not quite fitting for my wife. Sometimes, I'm even mistaken for her dad, which paints a picture of a rather plain-looking guy. Here, it seems I'm recognized as her husband. It might be a tad inappropriate given the situation, but there's a part of me that's a bit relieved. Since her younger days, my wife often caught the attention of men, so such flirtatious approaches are probably nothing new to her. But witnessing her getting hit on right in front of me is something I've never experienced, leaving me momentarily lost in thought. Ignoring them probably wouldn't make them back off, and shouting would be undignified for a grown man. They told me to leave, but as I remained in place, one of the impatient young men reached out for my wife. At that moment, she pushed his hand away, asking, Are you ready for this? Almost in harmony, the thugs voiced a collective huh, but the same words inadvertently came out of my mouth. Looking back, this incident became the catalyst for me regaining control over my life. My name is Bob. I'm turning 57 this year. At 6'3", I'm considered tall for my age group. I still have decent muscles and, while not exactly agile, I believe I have a good amount of dexterity. Thus, even if I get hassled by something, I'm not easily intimidated. The reason I still maintain a muscular physique at this age probably stems from my time in the military. When I was younger, I served in the military, it seems. At one point, I was deployed to a country long torn by civil war. There, under the orders of rebel forces, civilians engaged in gunfights, with even children exposed to danger daily. While the locals might have had reservations about trusting a foreigner like me, I did what I could, genuinely wanting to protect them, apparently. The repeated apparently and the uncertain details stem from a reason. I lost my memory and my right arm there. I found myself waking up in a hospital bed when I started remembering things. Seeing myself covered in bandages was more painful than the actual physical pain. But beyond the pain, not remembering who I was, was even harder. Name, I couldn't recall. Words, I hadn't forgotten. I could understand. I knew the names of things I saw, and I understood the basics needed to live. But that was it. Who am I? Where am I from? Every trace of my identity had been wiped clean. How am I supposed to live now? Amidst the despair, my sole beacon of hope was my wife, Catherine. Throughout my hospitalization, she visited me daily, never missing a day. At that time, I wasn't married, and honestly, I didn't even know who she was, but she was always by my side. Even if you forget about me, it would be great if we could make a lot of memories from now on. That's what she told me. When I was discharged from the hospital, we got married and she took on my last name. Having lost part of my body and my memory not coming back, I naturally had no place in the military and had to be discharged. I was then given a large amount of compensation. It was enough money that if I was frugal, I could live without working for the rest of my life, but I didn't want to just do nothing. So, I started job hunting. There were limited jobs I could do since I lost my dominant arm and my memory, and I was rejected in several interviews. Eventually, a small cleaning company hired me. I was assigned to places where I could work even with one arm missing, like cleaning offices or schools. I couldn't remember my past, but my life was fulfilling. Above all, when I got home, my beloved wife, Catherine, was there. I decided that this is my life now and found happiness in spending the rest of my life with Catherine. At her suggestion, I retired at 55. Fortunately, we had enough savings to live comfortably in retirement, and Catherine also worked. 
I had planned to keep working as long as I could, but I decided to retire because I didn't want to worry Catherine. However, I didn't really have any hobbies, so once I retired, I had a lot of free time. If I had to pick something close to a hobby, it would be my daily walks. I started going for walks almost every day. It was a beautiful Monday morning. That day, as usual, I prepared Catherine's breakfast and saw her off. After doing the laundry and some light cleaning, I left the house around 9 a.m. I guess you could call me a stay-at-home husband since I mainly take care of the housework. It was a routine to stop by the grocery store on my way back from my morning walk to buy dinner. On my walking route, there's a large housing complex and in front of it is a large park with no play equipment. My favorite spot was a bench in the corner where I always took a break. The European style design of the park Contrasting with the open space of a typical American park, somehow made it feel cozy. Sitting on the bench, I pulled out a paper bag from my eco-friendly bag and began reading a mystery novel I had been in the middle of. Nice weather, isn't it? Around the same age, or maybe a bit older, I guess. The man approached with a gentle smile and said such a greeting. Yes, it's a nice day. I'm not particularly bad at socializing, but being a bit of an introvert, I often feel awkward talking to someone I've just met. I awkwardly repeated his greeting, but the man showed no sign of annoyance and pointed at the bench. Mind if I sit here? Oh, right. This is a two-seater bench, but I was sitting right in the middle with my bag next to me, leaving no room for anyone else. I'm sorry, my bad. I quickly moved to the edge of the bench and placed my eco-friendly bag on my lap. No worries, I just wanted to chat with you for a bit. He said as he sat down next to me. Chat with me, that's a first. Catherine enjoys my boring stories, but I can't remember anyone else ever enjoying a conversation with me, especially an older guy like me. Noticing my puzzled look, the man shook his head and tried to clear things up. Sorry for the sudden approach, my name's Jason. Uh, Jason, why do you? Before I could finish, Jason cut me off with a soft smile. You come to this park every day, right? I do too. I think it's great how there's no play equipment here, don't you agree? I suppose it's more of a plaza than a park since there's no play equipment, but it's named Johnson Park. So I guess it's still a park. I'm not one to beat around the bush. Would you be interested in trying out some supplements? Supplements? I wonder if this man also sells health foods. Did he just happen to decide to pitch to a middle-aged man who seemed to enjoy sports? This is a sample, so I'm giving it to you for free. Please try it if you'd like. Despite his calm tone, Jason forcefully placed the pill in my hand. Well, it's probably fine to take it if it's a free sample. I could always just toss it without taking it. At first glance, it just looks like any regular medication. Please do take it. I'll be here again, and I'd like to hear your thoughts. As I'm dumbfoundedly watching Jason leave briskly from the bench, he suddenly looks back. See you again, Bob. At the same time he called my name. I grimaced from a sudden headache, and I couldn't get Jason's gentle face out of my mind. Wait, did I tell him my name? That night, when I told the story to Catherine, she told me to throw away the supplement. You should change your walking route too. Seems like a dangerous person. Best to avoid him. Catherine has a point. After all, only someone with a serious lack of judgment would take pills from anyone other than a pharmacy or doctor. Of course, I don't intend to take it, but I'd feel bad faking it next time I meet him. I'm not good at lying. I'd probably give myself away. You don't have to meet him. He doesn't know where you live, right? I wonder, he didn't seem to know my name. If he knows my walking route and my last name, he could potentially find where I live. If you run into him by any chance, call the cops. He's definitely a bad guy. I have a bad feeling. 
Though Catherine isn't a fortune teller and doesn't have any psychic vibes, her hunches often turn out to be right. I know that even though it is only a hunch, in her case, it should never be taken lightly. I took her advice and changed my walking route the next day. I even chose streets I had never walked on before, passing buildings I'd never seen. The novelty of these unfamiliar sights made me realize I had grown bored of my usual walks. Even though I've been living in this town for over 10 years, there's so much I don't know. Watching the stream of cars from an overpass, I felt a sudden push from behind. I desperately grabbed onto the railing with my left arm as I almost fell over. When I looked around, there was no sign of the person who tried to push me. Crossing the railings and stepping onto the pedestrian overpass, I immediately sat down on the spot. Having narrowly escaped death, I remained seated there until the trembling in my legs subsided. I was certain someone was after me a few days after that near fall from the overpass. Flower pots falling from above, being pushed while waiting at the lights. I managed to dodge these threats, but what I couldn't forgive was someone trying to set my house on fire. Luckily, I noticed right away and it was just a minor fire, but now there's a chance my wife is in danger too, so I reluctantly called the police. Of course, they can't provide 24-7 protection, but they said they'd increase patrols and be ready to respond if anything happens. Having some surveillance is somewhat reassuring. Honestly, I'll be fine as long as Catherine is safe. That's all I care about. And then, for about a week, things were peaceful. Maybe they got scared off seeing the police around our place. That's fine by me. As long as they stay away, it doesn't matter if they are caught or not. There's been no contact from Jason, and no incidents either. Catherine seemed relieved too, and we resumed our normal lives. Then, out of the blue, how about we take a vacation? I could get some extended time off, she suggested an overseas trip. Catherine's desired destination was Spain. We had discussed going there for our honeymoon, but given the uncertainty at the time, we decided against depleting our savings. Instead, we opted for a trip to Savannah, Georgia. During that trip, Catherine fell in love with Savannah and has visited there several times since. I assumed this time would be another trip to Savannah, but was surprised it was abroad. It's fine, let's go. We couldn't go abroad on our honeymoon. In fact, it's been almost 10 years since our last trip, I remarked. We both had jobs and rarely got time off together, so it had been quite some time since our last real vacation. Watching Catherine excitedly planning to buy new outfits and bags for the trip made me smile and I too began to look forward to the trip. Traveling abroad, huh? I glanced at my right arm, which was missing from the elbow down. Where had I been deployed? Catherine never liked discussing that period, so I never pressed for details. As such, I don't know where it was or what the conditions were like. There had been ongoing conflict but I doubted it was Spain. Boarding a plane might bring back memories. Feeling a phantom pain in my missing arm, I brushed aside my negative thoughts. I began searching online for tourist spots in Spain and listing places I wanted to visit. The following month, we proceeded with our travel plans as scheduled. Arriving at the airport two hours before our flight, we decided to relax in the lobby. A week-long stay. Though it wasn't my first time abroad, I'd lost my memories of it. It felt like the first time. I hoped I wouldn't feel homesick. Apparently, the flight to Spain would be quite long. Not being great at sitting still for long periods, the thought made me dizzy. I'll get us something to drink, I told Catherine, and as we walked, she expressed a desire to explore the airport. Even in her 40s, she hadn't lost her childlike enthusiasm. Chuckling, I walked beside her as she cheerfully linked arms with me. Hey, old man, why don't you leave that beautiful lady and go home? A voice suddenly interrupted. A group of men stood directly in front of us. Startled, I stepped back, 
pulling Catherine with me. She stumbled and fell backward. I quickly knelt beside her, supporting her back, and looked up at the men, asking, What do you want? Didn't you hear? Guess old folks have trouble hearing. One jeered, laughing loudly. What was so funny? We'll take care of her now. You can go, old man. With a shooing gesture, as if driving away an animal, one of the men reaches out to Catherine. However, Catherine forcefully pushes his hand away. Staring the men down with an uncharacteristically sharp tone, she says, Are you ready for what's coming, huh? Not just the men, but even I was taken aback. Could Catherine have martial arts training I didn't know about? We'd been together a long time, but I'd never heard of such a thing. But then again, maybe she had learned some when she was younger. Could it really be that a showdown is about to unfold right here? No way, she wouldn't ruin the upcoming vacation. She was so looking forward to it after all. Besides, I can't even imagine her getting into a physical fight. Does that mean it's up to me to step in? Stunned, I stare at Catherine's face, and she stares right back. Her expression seemed a mix of emotions, hard to describe. Our eyes locked for a few seconds, but suddenly, Catherine looks away, biting her lower lip. I can't completely understand the feelings of Catherine, and for some reason, the men don't seem to take any action either. The situation is in a stalemate, with everyone in the vicinity feeling awkward. Sorry, I apologize, but thy, why are you apologizing? Confused, I tried to ask Catherine for clarification but the men seem to have run out of patience. Hey, don't ignore us like that. A man roughly grabbed my jacket collar and forced me to stand. His strength, coming from what appeared to be a nearly 6'5 Paul frame, was just as imposing as he looked. One solid hit from those massive arms could knock anyone out. Come at me, man. Surprisingly, he let go of my collar and wanted a fair fight. What is he thinking? I can't even understand Catherine's intentions. I'm paralyzed with confusion and honestly, I don't feel like engaging. I can't imagine coming out of a fight with such a huge guy unscathed. Being close to 60, I know better than anyone how vulnerable my body is to impacts. Seeing my distress, the man did not hesitate and raised his fist. Anticipating the damage to my left cheek, I cringe, but suddenly, Everything around me moves in slow motion. His right hand is slowly coming at me. Seeing his attack, my body reacts on its own accord. My left hand lands a counterpunch, almost like it's being drawn in, right into his left chest. The next moment, he was lying in front of me, eyes rolled back. My heart is pounding. I tried to calm myself, but strangely, my mind was incredibly calm. It felt as if I wasn't myself, as if someone else had taken control of my body, making everything seem so distant. Ah, a woman's scream echoed from somewhere. She must have seen me knock the man down. Only then was I able to move again. I called out to the man, foaming at the mouth, completely still. But there was no response, no breathing. I tried to feel for a pulse on his wrist and chest, but nothing. I turned white. Hey, come on, breathe. My attempts at CPR, done as best as I remembered, were to no avail. The man didn't budge. With the other men just standing there in shock, not knowing what to do, I continued desperately trying to revive him. Please, please breathe. Excuse me, Jason. The guy who had given me some supplements at the park the other day pushed me aside as tears welled up in my eyes. He pulled out a machine from his bag. Maybe it's an AED or something. He placed it on the man's chest, hit a button, and the man's body jolted. A few seconds later, the man, drooling, came back to life. Unuck, he spat out saliva, and as if realizing what had happened to him, the man shivered. The men exchanged glances with Jason and left with a nod. Seems like they knew Jason.
still confused and shaken up. Jason smiled at me. Let's have a talk, somewhere we can sit down and relax. I canceled the trip. Neither Catherine nor I felt in the mood for a vacation anymore. I later explained the whole situation to the security officers who had arrived. Objectively speaking, I was the aggressor, so it'd be their duty to hand me over to the police. But the man I had hurt didn't press any charges. With Jason testifying on my behalf, confirming it was self-defense, I was let go without any legal complications. While we could have barely made our flight, neither Catherine nor I felt like we could enjoy the trip, so we decided to cancel. Taking Jason, who wanted to chat somewhere peaceful, we headed home. I had planned to meet him at a local cafe, but surprisingly, it was Catherine who suggested we talk at home. It was supposed to be the first time Catherine and Jason met. Given that Catherine seemed to detest Jason for giving me some sketchy pills, I wondered why she'd invite such a man into our home. After all, he had stood up for me during that airport kerfuffle, so maybe this was her way of returning the favor. Once we got to the house, we got straight to the point without any small talk. So, where should we start? Sipping the coffee Catherine had made, Jason shrugged with palms facing up. To be honest, I haven't a clue what's happening to me right now. If it's no trouble, could you first tell me who you are? Jason nodded slowly with his eyes closed, of course. My profession is a doctor. I've retired from active practice. And as for our connection, Bob, you were once my patient. Patient. Oh, when I was still in the military. I had a severe injury and was out of it for a long time, so I don't remember who my doctor was. Looking down at where my right arm used to be, I begin to say, about that time, in gratitude, but Jason stops me. No need to thank me, I don't deserve it. What do you mean? Taking a deep breath, Jason slowly exhaled while looking up at the ceiling. What has Catherine told you about your past? How so? My past? My past? My past that I can't even remember. I told Jason everything I remembered. That I used to be a soldier, how I lost my right arm in the line of duty, and how I had no memories of that time. Throughout my explanation, Jason listened intently, a mix of sympathy and pity in his eyes. When I finished, he simply said, I see. Turning to Catherine, he asked, should I tell him the truth? Catherine remained silent. Taking her silence as consent, Jason began to reveal the truth to me, urging me to stay calm throughout. Bob, first off, you weren't a regular soldier. You were part of a special ops team. Wait, hold on. So you're saying I wasn't in the military, but in this special ops team. Then has Catherine been lying to me? Honestly, the details about my past, whether I was a soldier or part of some elite squad, didn't matter to me. But finding out Catherine might have lied was a shock. Catherine's silence seemed to confirm Jason's words. Please, calm down. I'm sure Catherine had her reasons for not telling you the whole truth. She wouldn't lie out of malice, right? Catherine remained silent, her face unreadable. While you might not immediately understand or accept this, let me continue. You were part of a team sent on a mission to quell a civil war in a certain country. As for who exactly commissioned this mission, only the top brass knew, so even I don't know the specifics. Anyway, you went to that country, and thanks to your efforts, the war ended. I was probably being praised, but the shock of Catherine's possible deception had me feeling like I was listening to someone else's heroic tale. I tried to stay engaged, but what Jason said next left me stunned. You were extraordinary. After all, you alone took the lives of 96 people. I must have looked ridiculous with my mouth hanging open. Perhaps Catherine was crying at seeing my reaction, but I couldn't tell. Of course, given the circumstances, you can't be compared to some random criminals. It's probably more accurate to say the past you. In any case, you neutralized enemy forces with overwhelming power. But at the same time, questions arose. Questions. Yes. Is there value in peace that comes at the cost of other people's lives? 
taking other people's life. Yes, I had been prepared for the possibility, especially since I believed I had lost my arm in combat. But, 96 people, that number was too high, and I couldn't hide my shock. Bob, it's all in the past, you don't need to feel guilty about it now, but the main point is yet to come. I couldn't imagine anything more shocking. My breathing became erratic, and my vision blurred. My brain, unable to accept reality, seems to be trying to escape by blacking out. Bang! With a loud noise, I slapped both of my cheeks. Tell me, please continue. I'll never run away. I'll face my past. Someone from the top of the organization has ordered that you, who are injured and recuperating, be taken out. Why target my life? A soldier must not have individuality. That should be the same for any unit. If each starts questioning their actions, the chain of command won't function, and the entire unit could fall apart. I'll skip the details due to the length. Firstly, the reason you got injured was that, in battle, you showed such an overwhelming presence that the remaining enemies couldn't tolerate. From a momentary lapse in judgment, you were ambushed by multiple enemy soldiers and lost your right arm. I felt a pulse in my upper arm. The local hospital was ill-equipped, and the treatment given was only temporary. Had you been just an incompetent grunt, you'd probably have been left to die, but the organization wouldn't abandon you, their hero. Unconscious, you were immediately transported to the U.S. That's when I met Jason, huh? I underwent a surgery, and although my severed right arm wasn't restored, I managed to survive, it seems. Um, had I already lost my memory by that time? It's a natural assumption. Due to severe physical injury, my brain must have received a significant shock and caused memory loss. Makes sense. No, you still had your memories, because the one who stole them was none other than me. War. Jason, why? Jason, rubbing his forehead, and with hesitation, said, I had no choice. You seem to have hinted to close friends about leaving the unit, and a man who heard of this reported it to the higher-ups. I don't know the details of how the decision was made to deal with you, but they probably considered you a potential risk just for hinting about leaving the unit. Given it was a secret unit, they probably had various secrets and there might have been concerns about a leak. But there was someone who opposed your removal. He was your superior. Citing your achievements and character, he begged for your life. Of course, he was turned down, but he persisted. In the end, at the cost of his own life, he saved yours. So, you're saying he died, in my place. Jason looked genuinely regretful and nodded deeply. That man was. Jason's gaze shifted to Catherine, Catherine's father. Without thinking, I stood up from my chair. A mug fell over, spilling coffee, but no one seemed to care. Catherine. It was mind-blowing. The thought that my beloved wife's father died because of me. Given his sacrifice, you were saved, but it wasn't as simple as letting you go free. They asked me to erase your memory. But erasing memories isn't as easy as it sounds. After trying various methods, I finally got a drug that could induce amnesia. It's obviously illegal, though. So I was made to drink that and lost my memories. Physically, you recovered well. Regarding memories, it might sound insensitive to say smoothly, but we managed to erase them without issues. And once you were fit to be discharged, you were united with Catherine, the daughter of your former boss, and led a happy life. Jason, ending the story with a deep emotion, stared intently into my eyes. Now, why did I appear before you now? It's to observe your condition. So, you came to check if my memories are indeed gone. Jason clapped his hands and nodded exaggeratedly. You are quick to grasp, exactly. But isn't that contradictory? If your job is to ensure my memory is gone, why tell me all about the past? Jason grinned mischievously and said, You really catch on fast. It's simple. The organization you belong to wants your memories permanently gone, 
So, all you need to do here is drink the amnesia drug again. But if I suddenly told you to drink this, you'd find it suspicious, wouldn't you? Like when you discarded the supplements I gave you earlier. That's why I decided to be transparent and have you drink it willingly. After all, it'll be erased from your memory anyway. Why not spill the beans about the organization here? So, Bob, if you take this, everything will be resolved. With a wink, Jason presented a single pill in his palm. This is the memory erasing drug. Yes, it's a safer version than the one you took before. Go on, take it. Jason forcefully placed the pill in my hand. He sighed, saying, phew, and drained his cup of coffee. After all the talking, his throat must be parched. This lifts a weight off my shoulders. If I take this, I'll forget about Catherine. What's more, I might even forget who I am. Plagued by this fear, I stared blankly at the pill in my palm. You want to spend a peaceful retirement with your wife, don't you? A smart man like you understands what I'm getting at, right? Do I have no other choice? After all, it's rather audacious for someone like me, who's taken so many lives, to now wish for my own happiness. Moreover, if taking this pill ensures no harm comes to Catherine, then losing my memories seems a small price to pay. But, I'm sorry, I can't take it. Come on, Bob. After coming this far, don't get cold feet. Living your life constantly under surveillance. I don't want to lose Catherine, not even my memories. Catherine has always stood by me selflessly. Even if she lied, it's not a big deal. I believe she did it for my sake. Besides, I'm certain she isn't the kind to use people for her own benefit. Above all, she's not the kind of woman who would condone being saved at the expense of someone else's sacrifice. That's why I trust her. I'll even forgive her lies. I don't know what this organization plans for us, but I'll protect her with all I've got. Even at my age, with a body that hardly moves. Moreover, I'm missing an arm. There's little I can do. Honestly, I'm not confident I can protect Catherine to the end. But I can dedicate the rest of my life to her. To spend my life with her till the end. Oh, choke. Suddenly, Jason began to vomit. While I was shocked, Catherine remained calm. Is this? Finally, I've fulfilled my promise. As Jason glared at Catherine, she returned his gaze coldly. How does your own medicine taste? You, where did you get this? You don't need to know. You'd forget even if I told you. Cursing, Jason ripped in pain for about 10 minutes before passing out. After a while, Catherine, who had been looking down at Jason, turned to me, shedding a tear. It's over, finally. I'll tell you everything. He just wanted to test his drug. An hour later, Jason woke up. Not remembering who he was, I took him to a local police station, saying, I found this elderly man wandering around and left the rest to the police. Considering the drug's effects, I doubt he'll have a peaceful retirement. When I got home, Catherine, who had cleaned up Jason's mess, was waiting. Most of what Jason said was true, but some things were different. She had apparently learned about my situation from her father. The organization initially wanted to use me in a support role after I got injured and was no longer fit to be a soldier. However, Jason opposed that. He was eager to test his drug on me, suggesting to erase my memory and then expel me from the organization. Jason, it seems, had relatives in the higher-ups of the organization, and due to their influence, his opinion was accepted. So, I became a guinea pig to prove the effects of his drug. Just before taking the drug, I cleverly crushed it in my hand and ingested only half a pull. Realizing this, Catherine approached me, drooling and feeble, and took the half pill from my clenched hand. As my consciousness became cloudy, I stared at Catherine. She told me that she swore vengeance upon Jason through her determined eyes. It turns out Catherine's father had also died because of Jason's malicious advice. 
Catherine's father, who had opposed making me take the unknown drug till the end, was literally axed under the pretense of taking responsibility for his subordinates. Between her father and me, Catherine held a deep-seated resentment towards Jason. But then we got married and lived peacefully. While Catherine considered forgetting everything and living quietly together, deep down she wished I wouldn't lose my fighting spirit or thirst for vengeance. She wanted us to confront and take down our enemy together. But her internal struggle of not wanting to taint my hands any further has tormented her for a long time. Then, the opportunity came. Having been on the lookout, Catherine managed to invite Jason to our home and accomplished her goal. I'm sorry for lying. You must be disappointed, but I just couldn't forgive him, especially Jason. I'd understand if you'd want a divorce. Catherine said with a forced smile. Listening to her shaky voice, anyone could tell she was putting on a brave face, not just me. I told Jason too, I don't blame you for lying, Catherine, and I would have wanted to avenge your father, who defended me to the end, although I sadly don't remember it. I can't recall the emotions of that time, or her father. Still, I must have found it absolutely unforgivable. She's not a part of the organization, so she doesn't know the details, and apparently, her father only told her about how I was treated. I may have lost my right arm and my past memories, but now I have my left arm and you, that's more than enough for me. With my only arm, I hugged Catherine tightly. Feeling her slender, fragile body sobbing in my embrace made her seem so vulnerable. Jason's situation became a minor news story. Although his real name wasn't disclosed, Jason was seen wandering around in an obvious state of confusion and it garnered some public interest. For some reason, the media tracked down my address as the person who found him, but I declined all interviews and maintained my silence. It's only natural for me, the person involved, not to comment, but it makes me wonder why, after taking the same half pill, I only lost my memory while Jason lost his entire sense of self. But it's pointless to ponder it now, Catherine and I have continued a healthy marital relationship. We even went on our long-anticipated trip to Spain, enjoying our first ever overseas journey as a couple. Catherine mentioned excitedly that she wanted to visit every country in Europe. Even if we visited one country a year, we'd have to live past 100, but living a long life just to see her smile seems worth it.